For this module, instead of having written notes, we're going to look at a series of PowerPoint slides um, that were developed um, by the department on statistics and data integrity. And so the goal is for this last module is to kind of end the course on some take homes that we hope you take with, you know, in your everyday life. And so one of the goals of a course or an introductory statistics course rather is that when you go forth into the world now and you're presented with different types of information that you critically think about um, the information that's presented to you so that you can make a good conclusions. And so in these PowerPoints, we're going to look at some of the pitfalls of data, as well as some things that it's important to look out for and how to critically look at information that's presented to you. And so that's basically what this slide is saying is um, one of the reasons that a course like this is in general education is to give you an idea that you know a lot of times you're going to be giving conclusions about a population and a parameter that's based off of a sample and a statistic and so we'd like you to be able to correctly interpret those results and to understand that you know, the information that you're given is often based off of that sample. So there's, you know, some variability, there might be some errors, and we want you to, you know, be able to critically think about that information. And so the tools that we've taught you in this class are to give you um, a tool set so that you can give that accurate representation of the population. But unfortunately, there are a lot of people or um, entities that put out information that don't necessarily share that goal. And so what we want to do is give you some information to help you determine when someone is misusing data and statistics. So one of the best ways to evaluate information that's presented to you in the real world is through the SCAM method. And so SCAN is an acronym that stands for Sources, Conditions, Accuracy, and Motive. And so we're going to look at each of these four pieces. So whenever you're presented information, where you want to start out with is the source. Where is that data coming from? And so from a statistical point of view, the most important questions you can ask is, do the data come from an observational study or an experiment? And so we saw at the very beginning of this course that when data comes from an observational study, we usually cannot claim causation. We really do need that randomized experiment. If a sample was used, what was the sample size? So you saw in order to use the central limit theorem, we did have um, certain sample size requirements. Now that's not saying that we always have to go and talk to thousands or tens of thousands of people. You know, usually we can talk to much less than that to get valid responses, but we do want to make sure they're not going out and say just talking to five people. If a sample is used, how is the sample collected? You know, was there a bias in the study? And so at the very beginning of the course, we talked about data collection and why it's important not to have biased samples. And these are all important because if we don't have a good source that our data comes from, then we know that the conclusions we reach based off of that data may not be reasonable. And then of course there are some other questions that you should ask. So there's been a lot of talk lately about fake news and spreading, and so one of the things we want you to be able to spot is actual fake news. And so here's some ways that you can look for this. So one, whenever you see information that's presented to you from particular websites, have you heard of that website before? Is it a reputable source? You know, check the URL very carefully. Um, what is happening is there are websites that are mimicking real news sources, and if you don't look carefully, then you might not catch it. So if you look at this image that's here, you know, at first glance, it looks like it's from CNN. But if you look closer at CNN News, this isn't an actual real site. This is made to look like CNN. And next, look at that headline. The headline is going to tell you a lot. Does it seem plausible or is it just for shock value? So if we look at this um, article here, it says HIV de virus detected in Walmart bananas after 10-year-old boy contracts the virus. This is highly sensationalized. If we look at this picture, it looks like there is blood inside of a banana. This is does not seem very possible. It's there primarily for shock value. And so when you see headlines that you know use provocative language that are sensationalized, most of the time these are not going to be real. And this is when 
you know, you want to dig in deeper and really start looking at, okay, so they've made this claim. I don't want to take this at face value. Let me dig a little bit deeper and see if this is actually valid. So real news sources are going to have editors and journalists whose jobs depend on their reputation. And so professional journalists are going to do each of the following. They're going to put a date on the story. They're going to avoid significant misspelling and grammatical errors. They're going to credit the photos. They're going to have a byline and contact information and clearly discuss their sources. So unfortunately, the news has kind of been flooded with all of this basic garbage journalism stuff that isn't real and it's diluting the information that's out there. And so that's why, you know, it's on the consumer to really dig into the information that's presented to them to figure out, is it valid? Is it something that we can actually trust? And so for example here, um, here's some elements of a reliable story. Okay, notice we've got a date, an established source, and a byline with a link to the author. They've credited the photo. Uh, their sources are cited. And so this, these are the things that we wanna look for when we're trying to figure out, is this a story that we should actually give some kind of validity to. So the next thing we want to check are conditions. And so you can think of conditions as choosing the right tool for the job. And so suppose I ask you to help me hang a picture on a wall. Obviously, I don't want you to use a chainsaw. That's going to be the wrong tool for that job, and we're not going to get it done properly. Now, a chainsaw does have, you know, it is the right tool for some jobs, but not this one. What I'd like you to use is a hammer and nail to help me hang that picture. And we can think of data analysis in the same um, way. You know, data analysis has lots of tools, lots of ways we can look at the data, and we want to make sure that people are using those conditions properly. So from a statistical point of view, what does that check in conditions mean? It means what type of variable studying. So we've looked at quantitative and categorical, and we've seen that there's different ways to analyze and summarize each of these. So remember, for example, with a categorical, we used a bar graph and frequency tables and pie charts. But with quantitative, we used histograms and dot plots and box plots. Once a method has been chosen to summarize or analyze the data, have the conditions for this method been met? So in other words, do our, is our sample size large enough to meet the central limit theorem? You know, and we saw this throughout this course that, you know, we do need to make sure we check those conditions in order to have that valid inference. And so if you're looking at sites and they're using incorrect methods, that probably tells you they don't really know what they're doing and you maybe you shouldn't um, trust the information or the inference that they're providing. So for example, if we look at this graph, you know, here's a um, pie chart that was presented on the news. And if we look here, we know that pie charts, the percentages in them, the way that they should be presented is that they sum to one. And this one obviously does not. So the person making this pie chart may have had some kind of data, you know, that was good, but they obviously, they don't know how to summarize it. They don't know how to present it. So we probably shouldn't trust the inference that they're trying um, to make, because if they don't know how to make a pie chart, who knows what else they're getting wrong. And so notice here it says often a pie chart is a good choice for a categorical variable, but it can't be used here. Each wedge in the pie should be proportional to the amount of data in that category, and thus the sum of the percentages cannot exceed 100%. Next, we want to check accuracy. And so accuracy means that the proper use of statistical methods and a correct interpretation. And so this is one of the whole reasons you take this class. You are presented with um, the conclusions that are reached from data all the time. And so we want to give you a basic toolkit so that you can understand when somebody else gives you the results, did they do something reasonable? And so accuracy is going to include things like, did you label your axes on the graph with clear and constant scale? Did you label your units on your variables? Did you carry calculations, data entries, answers out over several decimal places to avoid rounding errors? So here's an example. And so, you know, don't be fooled again by bad graphs. You're gonna have a whole worksheet on bad graphs. Um, bad graphs appear all the time. And we wanna be really careful with that. So notice here's a graph that appeared in an ad and here's the blown up graph just to make it easier to read. So what do you think about this? You know, do you think this is a very good graph? Well, look, looking here, if we looked at this, you know, just at the bars, it gives the impression that Chevy is much higher than Nissan. 
But if we look here, they've started the y-axis at 95%. There's really only about a 3.5% difference between, or actually probably only a 3% difference between Chevy and Nissan. But the way that they've constructed this graph gives an incorrect impression of what's actually going on. So if we actually made the scale go from 0 to 100, notice that it doesn't look like there's much different from, different from the 4. And so this gives a very different impression. And this one is much better. You know, this one gives a clearer um, picture of what's happening. And so this is talking about um, that vertical axis or that y-axis again. So again, let's look at another one, okay? So what's going on here? So we're looking at a drug that hopefully improves memory. Well, here we can see that our y-axis is increasing by 5% starting at zero, but notice this is over a five-day period, this is over a 30, and this is over a 90. So again, we don't have even increments down here on the x-axis. So of course, we would expect much more improvement over 90 days versus just five. So here's, um, they've taken the same information, but scaled it properly with a change in the horizontal axis. And so notice here, we kind of see, okay, 90 days versus 30, we've had more time pass. And so that change doesn't seem nearly um, as extreme as it did with the other plot. And so this is a much better way to present this data. Here's another example. So a CNN exit poll for the state of Florida on the day of 2016 presidential election reported Clinton with a 47.7% of the vote and Trump with 46.4% of the vote with a 3% margin of error. After all the votes were tallied, Trump won Florida with 41.9% of the vote compared to 47.8% of the vote. And the question is, well, was the poll wrong? Because it made it look like Clinton was going to win. But there's a couple things we need to consider. One, we have no indication that the poll was conducted in an improper fashion, so we can't say the poll was wrong, but the interpretation may be incorrect. And so this is one of the reasons that we spent a lot of time talking about confidence intervals and what margin of error means. And so this says we'll see later this semester, um, but we've actually already seen this. A 3% margin of error means we can predict with a certain amount of confidence the percent of the vote. And so for Clinton, we expected to see between 44.7 and 50.7, and for Trump, between 43.4 and 49.4. So if we interpret this correctly, what actually ended up happening is not that big of a surprise. This was actually what we expected. So again, the actual Clinton vote was 47.8, and the actual Trump was 49.1. And notice both of these are inside of those confidence intervals. But this is why it's so important not just to use the statistic, but we also need to consider the margin of error when we interpret these results. So what was the issue? And so this is exactly what I was just saying. We've got to pay attention to that margin of error. We can't just look at the statistics. Motive. Motive is a big one. We're going to look at a push polls worksheet um, this week that talks about motive. So motive refers to the reason the data is being analyzed. Um, for us, you know, we want to think of this as kind of being unbiased. We just want to give an accurate representation of what's happening in the population. So our motivation is just to summarize the data set and see what's happening. You know, we're not trying to, you know, support one side or the other. We just want to see what is the data telling us. So ask yourself when reading a question or probably an article or a study, do those presenting the data have some other agenda? If they do, they may be steering you in a way that isn't very useful. So in other words, they're going to kind of drive you to their side without actually using the data. Who funded the study? You know, this is very important. If somebody's pouring a bunch of money into the study, they might want it, you know, the results to lean their way, even though the data may not suggest that. And so these are all things that we want to consider when we talk about motive for a study. And so here's an example. So vaccines being labeled the new gateway drug to heroin was the headline. So the source is by Racket Report, and a new study released by Feminist Against Vaccines shows that vaccines serve as a gateway drug to heroin. So notice this group, Feminist Against Vaccines, they may have some agenda that they're trying to push, which is going to influence how their, um, their inference about this study. So again, there might have a hidden agenda here that we want to 
you know, account for, and so we're going to proceed with caution. So in the next part of the video, we've just got a couple more slides to go, um, but my sophomore week's going to end at 15 minutes, so I will pick up in the next.